Hey, shalom and welcome to Wisdom and Torah Ministries. Today's teaching is going to be, I think in my opinion, one of those that is controversial and I try to stay away from to controversial topics. Although I teach Torah, which is a controversial uh, topic among, uh, along the whole world. But this one is called, there, there will never be a Melchizedek priesthood on the earth. Okay, today. And I know that's challenging, but we're going to present the evidence from a legal perspective. As you know, I've been teaching the, the temple for the last 22 years, and my teacher, Joseph Good, has been teaching the temple for the last 40, over 40 years now. And one of the things that I've done, I went back to college to learn about ancient Near Eastern history. And I'm very grateful that I've, I've, been, trying, I've, been, I've been keeping the promise I made to my father a long time ago, back in the late 80s when I wanted to play professional baseball, and he was concerned about my education. So I told him, someday I'm going to graduate. Someday I'm going to get all the stuff to make you proud. Well, he passed away 2005, and up to that moment, I didn't get my bachelor's or my master's. Well, now I decided to pursue those in the, in the, uh, in the context of ancient Near Eastern history and biblical history. So what I'm going to do today, I'm going to share with you all the verses as I was researching ancient Near East before I went back to college, and that's the reason why I decided to go back. Because I really wanted to understand this subject in a very, very deeper dimension. And what I found is that I was teaching certain things incorrectly. I was teaching certain things that I thought were right. And when I look into the evidence, and remember, evidence establishes the truth. Always remember that. Evidence establishes the truth. And we have to lose the fear of thinking that we have to be right in everything, that we cannot be wrong. And I found out that I was teaching something that without my intent, I was misleading people. When I went back to the evidence, I'm fixing it. And I want to share with you what I found. We're going to, re we're going to be reading a lot of verses right now. You know, but I want to give you some insight as to why I do no longer. I no longer believe that the kingdom of God, us, we are in the order of Melchizedek. And you don't have to believe me. Just allow me the opportunity to, to, uh, to uh, state my case. This has been going around for a little bit, of, for, a little, for a while. And the common denominator is that 99.9% .9 of the body of Messiah in the Torah do not study the temple. And you know that's true. The temple is the most neglected area of study. So what I decided to do was study the temple, focus on everything dealing with the temple, stem from the temple outward, like we were taught in the book of Exodus when the tabernacle was built, from the inside out, and then start complementing what I was learning from the inside out in the temple, uh, everything with history, archaeology, uh, so, um, geography, and ancient Near Eastern legal uh, treaties. So what I want to do first, I want to share with you the genealogy of Aaron. Many people, when they study the Bible, they study the priesthood, they have no idea of the distinction between the priestly family and the Levitical family. Although the priests are all Levites, not all the Levites are priests. So how do we know this? So let's go to the chart. Now, in the chart here, I get this from my Logos software. You can find this on Logos.com. And this is some of the stuff that I have. Here we have Levi. Let me make it a little bigger so you can see it. So I'm going to make it as big as I can so you can see it. And then we have Levi right here. It's quite big. And then Levi had three sons. Gershon, Kohat, Merari. Now, out of the three sons, we have Kohat. Kohat is, the, is the three son, one of the three sons of Levi that we need to focus. Because out of Kohat, he had Amram, Yitzhar, Hebron, Uziel, Aminadav. Now, these are all Levites, all of them. Merari and his sons, Gershon and his sons. And then you have Isar, Hebron, Uziel, Aminadav. But I want you to notice where Moses comes from. Moses comes from Amram. Now, out of that line comes the priestly family. Aaron had four sons. Nadab, Abihu, Eleazar, Itamar. We already know that Nadab and Abihu, they died. Because what did they do? This is an example of why I told you. No one can go into the Holy of Holies today. Because the sons of Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, they were ordained, they were 
consecrated. They were anointed to be priests of God in the tabernacle. And yet, they entered the Holy Holies uninvited on the wrong day, uninvited without the proper authority into the Holy Holies, and they died. Now, think about it logically. Right from the get-go, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, we have evidence number one. If the sons of Aaron, which were ordained, they were anointed, they were consecrated for the service of the tabernacle and even the holy place. When they enter the holy, holy holies uninvited, which because that job was reserved only for their father Aaron, then how in the world can we go into the holy holies? Well, people say, well, the book of Hebrews says, well, wait a minute. Let's go to the book of Hebrews, and I'm going to read you from this version that I have. It's called the Holy Scriptures Tree of Life Version. Right now, it really doesn't matter what version I read from, but I want to give you which one I'm reading from because we're going to read a lot of verses. Okay, so let's go to Hebrews chapter, 10, uh, chapter 8, verse 4. Let's see why I'm able to make such a bold statement that the Melchizedek priesthood could never be on the earth. Okay, today, today, it says, Hebrews 8, <clears throat> I'm going to read from verse 1 to verse 4. Now, there, now, here's the main point being said. We do have such a high priest who has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. He is a priestly attendant to the holy holies of the true tabernacle, which Adonai set up and not man. For every priest... Every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. So it is of necessary, necessity that for this one also to have something to offer. Now, if he, in this case Yeshua, were on earth, he would not be a priest at all, since they are those who offer the gifts according to the Torah. Now, the writer of the Hebrews clearly is telling us that if Yeshua was on earth, he would not be a priest at all. That's a big statement. Because if Yeshua himself, the son of the living Elohim, who resurrected, who became our high priest in only the heavenly, in the heavenly tabernacle, which by the way, you and I cannot officiate, neither do the Levites or the sons of Aaron can officiate in the heavenly tabernacle, one makes you and I think that we are now priests on the earth. When Yeshua will not be able to be a priest on the earth himself. That verse alone supports what I'm trying to share with you today. If we read it in context, it's promoting Yeshua as a high priest in the heavenly tabernacle. The only place that legally he can officiate because God had established a covenant with Aaron and his sons as a grant covenant. As a grant to, the, uh, to Aaron and his sons. And we're going to cover that in a minute. But right now, I'm trying to establish a foundation. The foundation that only the sons of Aaron can be in the holy place and the holy holies or the temple proper as we know it. There are certain areas that only the priest can do. Sacrifices, the altar, all the holy vessels, the manipulation of the blood. So if the manipulation of the blood can only be done by the priest and you are slaughtering a lamb on Passover and you are manipulating the blood and putting it on the doorposts of your homes, you are committing encroachment and the penalty in the Bible was death. And I also show you evidence when someone other than the priest tried to do the work of the priest and they have a heavy, a price, heavy price they paid. Okay? But talk is cheap. We need to establish the evidence. Right off the get-go, I'll give you the Number one piece of evidence, Yeshua himself could not be a priest on the earth at all, according to the Bible. So if Yeshua cannot be, then why, what makes us think that we can? In the order of Melchizedek, by the way, I, I, I'll challenge anywhere, anybody, to find one verse in Scripture that it literally says, that it literally says that you and I are priests in the order of Melchizedek, in the Bible. That you and I today are in the order of Melchizedek in the Bible, in the New Testament. Nowhere. The only place that it mentions Melchizedek is the book of Hebrews. And it's in reference to Yeshua, not us. Now, does it say that the kingdom is a kingdom of priests? Yeah, what is the difference between function or office? Can we hold the office of the priesthood? That's the question. But can we do the function of? Okay, so let me show you how you can do the function of without being a priest. Let's go to Ezekiel. Let's go to Ezekiel chapter 44, verse 23. 
23 and 24. I'm using a different Bible and it has the right the right order of the of the of the prophets and everything and now I'm lost. So what happens when we go the backwards? We do things the wrong way. All right, Ezekiel 44 verse 23 and 24 says this. They will teach my people the difference between the sons of uh, the holy and the common and explain to them the difference between the unclean and the clean. In lawsuits, they will stand to judge and judge in accordance to, with my ordinances and they will keep my laws and they will, my statutes and all of my feasts and keep my Sabbath holy. So who are these people that are going to do this? Verse 15, it says, in verse 15 says, So the Levitical Kohanim, the Levitical priests, the sons of Sadok, who kept charge of my sanctuary, when Bene Israel wandered before from me, will draw near to me and minister to me. They will stand before me and offer me the fat and the blood, declares, declares the Lord. So therefore now we have the sons of Sadok. Who are they? Let's go back to the genealogy. Because many people are using this to say, you see, Sadok, um, Melchizedek, because Sadok means righteous, Sadiq, righteous, king of righteousness. That's really a title. It's not really a person. Melech Sedek is a king of righteousness. It's a title of, a, uh, of an order. It's not even a person. Okay? So what we need to remember is, who is Sadok here? Sadok, according to scripture and the genealogy that we have here, is, whoops, sorry guys, it's going nuts on me here. On the genealogy, you see Eliezer right here, and you keep following his name. You have Pinchas, and then you have Abishua, Amariav, Jonathan, Shalom, Buki, Ahituv, Asaraya, Hilkaya, Uzi, Zadok. This is the Zadok the Bible is talking about in the time of David. Okay, there were, there were a few Zadoks. But the Sadox is from the line of Eliezer. Eliezer is the son of Aaron. Now, all of the sons of Aaron are priests. And they are all Levites. But not all of the Levites are priests. Let's go back to the chart to see what I mean. Okay, so you see the cursor in the middle. This is Amram, right here. Moses and Miriam. Out of Moses and Miriam, their sons are not priests. They're not, high, they're not of the sons of the priests. Aaron becomes the father of all the, high, all the priests. All of them. Then you have, now that Abiyo, they died. Eliezer and Itamar. Out of them two comes all of the priests in the history of Israel. And then this is their genealogy. Okay? So it is important that we recognize that these guys are all Levites. But the guys on the side of them, they are not priests. They are cousins. They are related. And this is a very important topic because Kohad, okay, he had another son. It's called Aminadav. And Aminadav had a son called Korah. Korah tried to encroach. Korah tried to encroach on the job of Moses and Aaron. He challenged them and they died. Korah and the sons of Reuben, they died because they challenged the authority of Moses and Aaron. Because Aaron was ordained, sanctified, separated, anointed to do the work. So now let me tell you how that whole thing works from a legal ancient Near Eastern perspective. All right. I have this notebook. I want to show it to you because this, this is part of my research on ancient Near Eastern um, covenants. There are 25 articles in this particular booklet that I have here, okay? I have like four or five of these, and I've been blessed to be able to gather a lot of articles, over 400 of them, on the topic of covenants, grand covenant, ancient Near Eastern, parity covenants, structure, treaty, language, legality, uh, statues, uh, customs, rituals, everything. And I've been able and I've been blessed to uh, be able to do the research on this, and what I found that there was an article that actually I have the books of the writer, a few of his books, and the name of the writer is Moshe Weinfeld. Moshe Weinfeld wrote an amazing book about uh, righteousness and justice 
in ancient Near Eastern, in the ancient Near East and in Israel. And I highly recommend you do that. But he also wrote uh, the, uh, another commentary on the book of Deuteronomy. Okay? And an article that I have right here is called The Covenant Grant in the, in the Old Testament and the Ancient Near East. Now, I have the article right here. This is not, this is not a person writing an article given their interpretation. This is a person doing research on ancient Near Eastern history, validating information. How do you know? Because of the bibliography. See, they have to post scholarly work. They have to put all the bibliography at the bottom. Okay? So you can validate yourself. What I'm going to do, I'm going to get this particular article from my, uh, from my, um, from my, air, uh, from my, what's it called? Um, um, I have it in, on the file here. I'll try to find it. And I'm going to put it on the chat so you can read it for yourself. So I'm going to read you a little bit about ancient Near Eastern history about the Grant Covenant. What is a Grant Covenant? We are going to be looking at the priesthood from a Grant Covenant perspective. A gift of God. That's what a Grant is. Now remember, Paul told us in the Bible that the gifts of God are irrevocable. Now we know that the land is a gift to the Lord. The Lord gave that as a gift in a unilateral covenant he made with Abraham in Genesis 15. He also gave the children of Israel, the descendants, as an, also a gift to Abraham for his service. Also, the kingship was given to David. All of the tri all of the Jews, um, all of the sons of David are Jews, but not all the members of the tribe of Judah are the sons of David. Okay, because the same thing as the priesthood, the Levites, the sons of Aaron. Okay, so all of the Jews are from the tribe of Judah, but not all the people from the tribe of Judah can become kings of the line of David because that only comes through the line of David. Okay, same thing. So here I'm going to read to you from some of the pages, and I have to read it because this is, establishes the foundation, the biblical and historical background to understand what the Bible is trying to tell us. Remember, Scripture was written for us, but not to us. Scripture was written in a time frame, and that quote was, uh, was coined by John Walton, okay? The Scripture was written to an area and, a, and an environment that we are reading the narrative, but we're not understanding the context of what has been written. Now, there are things that I want to read to you that you can compare in the Bible, and the language the Bible used is in a legal in nature. Once you understand the biblical language and the way that it's built, then when you read the verses, it makes perfect sense. So when you understand culture and rituals, you read the verses, everything makes logical, perfect, fits. Everything is, is fixed perfectly, okay? So let me read here from the first paragraph on page 184 of this particular article, all right? It says this. There are two types of covenant that are found in the Old Testament. The obligatory type reflected in the covenant of God on, with Israel and the promissory type reflected in the Abrahamic and Davidic. So the scholars don't understand there is a uh, what is called a suzerain vassal, suzerain or a vassal treaty, which is a master or a patron and the vassals, the servants. That's what happened on Mount Sinai. But then there is the, uh, the one that is called the grant. Here he calls it a promissory type uh, that was God given a promise. He gave it to Abraham, he gave it to David, but he also gave it to the sons of Aaron. We're going to investigate this. And it says this. The nature of the covenant of God with Israel has been thoroughly investigated and recently cl uh, clarified by a comparison with the treaty formulations in the ancient Near East. The nature of the Abrahamic Devi uh, Davidic covenant, however, still vague and needs a clarification. The present study suggests a new way of understanding in the character of the Abrahamic Davidic covenant and in these by means of a topological and functional comparison with the grant formula of the engineers. I, I, I wanted to finish my thought in the book of Ezekiel that I read you the verses between function and office before I continue. When you go and talk to someone, I told you we can all do the function of a priest, but not do the office of. And the best example I can give you is, I'm retracing my steps a little bit, so I, there's no confusion. Let's say that you went to law school, but you never got to law degree. 
you went to law school and then you never got the uh, the you never passed the bar and you just you are you study law you are very good in law uh, as, uh, you could have been a great lawyer but you don't have the piece of paper that validates you as a uh, a legit lawyer you can talk law if you want but if you don't have the paper you cannot you cannot use the office of a law of law the of lawyer you know what I mean okay. So you can give someone legal advice based on what you know, but you have to make a, you got to make a, uh, uh, um, you have to make sure you make a statement telling him, I'm not a lawyer. I'm only giving you my advice. Okay. Now we can help people understand the times and the seasons. That's what the Leviticus, uh, what Ezekiel 44 verse 23 and 24 tells us that the priests, the sons of Sadok, okay, the sons of Sadok, who are the sons of Aaron. We're going to go back to the genealogy. They're the ones that God chose to teach us the holy and profane, the clean and unclean, to in matters of controversy, to go and do what is right and keep the Sabbath holy and to do the things of the temple and the feast. We know that. But right now you can still help somebody understand clean and unclean. Although you may not be a priest of the line of Aaron. You can show them how to follow a, the calendar that God has established in the Bible that all of Israel follows. You can still lead them, but you are showing them what's clean and unclean is. You're still doing a function. God is using us as a living organism to show the people how we are to live holy lives. Because the priests were separated for the purpose of teaching Israel how to live separated holy lives. Now you have the opportunity to do that with the world. But that does not mean that you have the right to officiate and do the work of the priest. Although all of Israel, they were helping people saying, no, we don't eat the unclean. And we follow the feast. And we worship God this way. And we pray this way. And we bring offerings this way. A regular Israelite still could not go into the temple and go into the holy place and the holy holies pretending to do the office of the priesthood. And that's what we're questioning here. Many people are doing the office of the priesthood when you change the calendar, when you manipulate the blood, when you change the feast days, when you change the name. When you do the ironic blessing, you are now doing the office of the priesthood. Well, Rico, how do you know that? Because this week's Torah portion tells you. The book of Numbers, chapter 6, verse 22 says this. And again, Adonai spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and to his sons, saying, Thus you are to bless the children of Israel by say, and say to them, Adonai bless you, Adonai keep you. Okay? Now the command is given directly to the sons of Aaron. They are the ones who bless the children of Israel with the ironic, ble ironic blessing for crying out loud. Now, what's interesting is that because we say we are now in the order of Melchizedek, like some people say, say, they are now saying the prayer that God gave directly to the sons of Aaron. Now, did God change his mind all of a sudden now 2,000 years later and says any Israelite or any Gentile who grabbed themselves into the kingdom, you can do whatever you want and do as you please? Because this was given to them. And it says in verse 27, in this way, they are to bless, they are to place my name over the children of Israel, and I will bless them. Now, people focus on whether or not you use the name to use the ironic blessing, but does it really matter if you use the name and the person saying it is not a son of Aaron, who are the ones who are supposed to say the blessing? Guys, we're in trouble. We do not understand the Bible from a legal perspective. We are encroaching on the holy things. We don't even know it. And there are sons of Aaron walking around. There are sons of Aaron and Levites who are doing the work of teaching Torah. But we don't respect them either. So it's really weird because now we just think we know everything and we are changing things that we don't have the legal jurisdiction to change. Please take notes. Ask me questions after the teaching. We can discuss the, uh, uh, a little bit more. So let me go back now to the article. It says, The present study suggest a new way of understanding the character of an Abrahamic and Davidic covenants, and this by means of a uh, typological and functional comparison with the grant formula, the grant formula of the ancient Near East. 
two types of official judicial documents have been diffused in the Mesopotamian cultural sphere for the middle and uh, for the middle and the second millennium onward. The political treaty, and this is the important part. This is my if you study with any scholar in the university level or any doctorate, and you're trying to present this type of evidence, okay, you need to show them a precedent in order for a, anything to be established. That's just the way law works. That's just the way anything works. You show the evidence, and based on the evidence, you can make a, a rational decision. You can make the proper judgment. And we need to do the same. The times of just coming up with crazy theologies based on what we understand need to stop. We have the evidence. We have the information. We have everything available that will help us make a better decision and become better servants of God. But yet we are still thinking the way we thought in the denominational world, according to the imagination of my own logical mind. And we have to stop that. I highly recommend we do this. Okay? So I will send you the article, put it on the chat. You can read everything. Do me a favor. Read the bibliography, all the, recommend, all the resources that they, this man used to put this article together. And then do what I did. Go back and validate every single one of them. Took me four months to go through this article. So yes, I know the topic. Okay. All right. So it says, the political treaty, which is well known for us from the Hittite Empire, and the royal grant, the classical form of which is found in the Babylonian Kuduru document, Boundary Stones, by which occurs as such also among the Hittites in the Syro-Palestine area and in the Neo-Assyrian period. The structure of both types of these documents is similar. Both preserve the same element, historical introduction, border delineations, stipulations, witnesses, blessings, and curses. What that means is that the Bible lines up with ancient Near Eastern treaties, the structure and the way that an ancient covenantal language was used. The Bible lines up with the ancient international treaties of its time. It is a valid living document, still binding. And this is a really cool part. In the ancient world, as long as the king was alive, that document and that treaty was still binding. I want to repeat this again. As long as the king was alive, that treaty was binding forever until he dies. That's why the word olam can represent a certain time. Because they understood that it's forever as long as that king is alive to uphold the treaty uh, 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 covenantal agreement. Now what they would do if that king is going to die, then he would renew the covenant with his son. His son now will become the heir of the kingdom and by default he will become the one who has to continue that treaty with whoever he made covenant with. That's why Yeshua says, I've come to renew the covenant. To renew the covenant so that Israel can maintain the relationship with God and then the priesthood can maintain their job continually in the temple as mediators and benefactors of the kingdom. All right, let's continue. Functionally, however, there is a vast difference between these two types of documents. While the treaty, now this is the important part, don't miss this part. While the treaty constitute an obligation of the vassal to his master, the suzerain. This is huge. So when you have Mount Sinai, Mount Sinai becomes a bilateral covenant, a covenant between Israel and God, God and Israel. Now the Lord uh, um, uh, uh, started the process of becoming covenantal with Israel. But Israel agreed and they made an oath. They agreed to follow through on any of the conditions of the covenant. Thus, it's bilateral. God will protect us. He will bless us. He will lead us as long as we obey the commandments. That is called a suzerain vassal treaty in the scholarly world. All right. It says the suzerain. Let me read that again. While the treaty constitute an obligation of the vassal or the servant to his master, the suzerain, the grant constitute an obligation of the master to his servant. That's the difference between a treaty, master to the servant, okay? I mean, the, the servant to the, 
the 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 uh, the treaty is the the vassal obeys the 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 master, but in the grant, in the grant, is the master, okay, that constitutes an obligation of the master to the servant. In the grant, the curse is directed. Now this is important. This is the legal aspect you need to know. In the grant covenant, the curse is directed towards the one who will violate the rights of the king's vassals. So, David was a vassal king of God. God gave him and his family forever the kingship. So if anyone challenges David and his kingship, they're really challenging God because God put him there, and that's a gift of the, of the kingship to David, and no one can challenge it. If you challenge God's king on the earth, you are challenging God's authority. If you challenge the land, the land was a gift to Abraham and his sons forever. If you challenge and you speak against the land of Israel, you are challenging the one who gave the gift to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and the children of Israel. If you challenge the priesthood, or the temple service has been illegitimate. You are not challenging the, the sons of Aaron. You are challenging the one who gave the gift to the sons of Aaron, ladies and gentlemen. We are in trouble. So if you're calling yourself a priest in the order of Melchizedek, when God has never, never in the history of the Bible, if there's anything written that you and I have the authority or the, uh, the jurisdiction to do anything related to any kind of priesthood, of Melchizedek, specifically. There's no evidence. It's only Yeshua. That means that you are challenging the validity of the priests, the sons of Aaron, of the only ones that God chose to do the work. We are committing encroachment. Have we not learned the lesson from the story of Korah, who was, an, who was a Levite, and he wanted the job of the sons of Aaron? He was a Levite. He was not a priest. And God killed him. And anyone who came in agreement with Korah died. This is serious. And that's why I'm being very vocal and very straightforward with you. But I'm showing you the evidence. Not what I think, but what the Bible says. And what history says. All right? More importantly, the Bible, but history helps. It says, <clears throat> In the grant, the curse is directed towards the one who would violate the rights of the king's vassals. While in the treaty, the curse is directed towards the vassal who will violate the rights of, the, of his king. In other words, the grant serves mainly to protect the rights of the servant. The grant serves mainly to protect the rights of the servant. In this case, the land. In this case, the priesthood. In this case, the kingship. In this case, salvation. Remember, salvation is a grant. It's a gift. No one can take it back. No, God cannot take it back. He gave you a gift for your loyalty. If you rebel against God, you can reject the gift. Just like Israel rejected the land. Just like some of the priests rejected the priesthood. But God cannot take that gift back. He will not. All right? It says, Well, the treaty comes to protect the rights of the master. What is more, while the grant is a reward for loyalty and good deeds already performed, the treaty is an inducement for future loyalty. Two different things. Now I'm going to move forward a little bit because I want to read what I have here for you. In page 189 of the article, it says, Unconditional gift. I'm going to read you from the... I move forward a little bit so I could... For the sake of time, okay? But I'm going to post the article in full in the chat so you can go download it research it study it take notes and validate everything i tell you it says although the grant to abraham and david is close to its formulation to the neo assyrian grant and therefore may be late the promises the promises themselves as much older and reflect the hittai pattern of the grant the land and house dynasty the objects of the Abrahamic and the Davidic covenant, respect, respectively, are indeed the most prominent gifts of a king in the Hittite and Syrio-Palestinian uh, political reality. What they're trying to tell you is 
that the structure that the Bible talks about, the gift to Abraham and David, follows alone the language used in the ancient world when a king would give a grant to somebody. By the way, in the government today, when they give you a grant, they just did it with the whole COVID thing, the whole COVID uh, money they're giving away. You don't have to pay taxes. You don't have to give that back. That's a grant from the government to you. All right? So I'm going to read you a little history here. I know this is a little tedious. I know it is. But we cannot establish the truth if we don't look at all the evidence. And it's already people talking about speculation, what they feel it, th it means to them. Let's go into the evidence. We have a, this, is, this evidence goes back 3,000 years. Actually, a little bit more. 3,000 years. Okay? And it comes from primary sources. All right. It says, move on here. And indeed, the most prominent gifts of the suzerain in the Hittite and Syria, Syri Syro Palestinian political reality, and like the Hittite grants, so also the grant of land to Abraham and the grant of house to David are unconditional. Thus, we read in the treaty of Hattusilis the third, with Ulmitesuv of Datuza, Dataza. After now, listen to what it says in this treaty. After you, your sons and grandsons will possess it. It's a gift he gives to this particular person. Nobody will take it away from them. If one of your descendants sins, the king will prosecute him at his court. Then when he is found guilty, if he deserves death, he will die. But no one will take away from the descendants of Ulmitesuv either his house or his land in order to give it to a descendant of somebody else. Now, this is a huge precedent that validates the Bible. Because although the gift of the land was given to Abraham, Abraham, right? When the sons of Israel disobeyed the Torah, they were exiled. But we have the book of Ezra and Nehemiah that tells us that they returned. Because the land cannot be given away to anyone else, but only the people who received it as a grant, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And now you know why God ratified the covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, with Jacob, and then the children of Israel, so that they will come into a covenant, so they will receive as descendants of Abraham the same promise and the gifts that he gave Abraham in exchange for loyalty, which is the land and descendants. This is of importance for us to understand the point that I'm trying to make here today. It says, Then when he is found guilty, if he deserves death, he will die. But no one will take away from the descendants of Ul Mitashuv, either his house or his land, in order to give it to a descendant of somebody else. In a similar manner, Mursilis II reinforces the right of Kapantakal to the house, and the land in spite of his father's sin. A similar wording occurs in royal decree of another king of the ancient Near East, which says like this, Nobody in the future shall take away this house from U Manava or Teshuv Manava, her children, her grandchildren, and her offsprings. When any one of the descendants of U Manava provokes the anger of the kings, whether he is to be forgiven or whether he is to be killed, one would treat him according to the wish of his master, but his house they will not take away and they will not give it to anybody else. And this is a very important principle taken from ancient Near Eastern laws of surrounding nations around Israel because now God does the same thing. He is the king who finds favor and uh, Abraham finds favor in his eyes and he says, I want to give you a gift. I want to give you the children of Israel as gifts, and I want to give you all your descendants, and I want to give you the land as a gift. No one can do away with the children of Israel. That's why anytime you fight against the Jewish people and the children of Israel, you are fighting against God. Because God gave the children of Israel as a gift to, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And if you challenge the children, the people, the land, the priesthood, the kingship, then you're challenging God themselves. Okay, and then lastly, the same article in page, let me find it here real quick, 201, 
it talks about the grant of priesthood and priestly revenues. That means the tithe and the offerings. Okay? It says, The documents of grant in the ancient Near East also include grants of status. Okay? Priesthood. The priesthood of Aaron in Israel had also been conceived as an eternal grant. Thus we read in Numbers, chapter 25, verse 12 to 13, Pinchas, son of Eliezer, son of Aaron, the priest, has turned back my wrath from the Israelites by displaying among them his passion for me. Therefore, I grant him my pact. I grant him. So let's go to that verse. Let's go to Numbers. Chapter Numbers. I am almost there. I'm there, actually. 25. Numbers 25. Verse, we'll find it here, 12 and 13. Listen to what it says. This is important, right here. Verse uh, 10. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Pinchas, son of Eliezer, son of Aaron, the priest, turn away my anger from among the Israelites, when he was jealous for my jealousy in the midst of and I did not destroy the Israelites with my jealousy. Therefore, say, Behold, I am giving to him the word Natan. That's the word Natan. It's a gift. It's a grant. Give him my covenant of peace. And it will be for him and for his offsprings after him a covenant of an eternal priesthood because he was jealous for his God and made atonement for the Israelites. This is the evidence. God gave it to him for an eternal priesthood. And remember what I showed you earlier, as long as the king is alive, that gift is forever binding. As long as the king is alive, the treaty will prevail forever. If you are telling me that now God did away with the ironic priesthood, you mean to tell me that God died? Because that's the only way that grant can be taken away. It's no longer valid if the king is no longer here. The moment the king is not here, then the next leader can just do whatever he wants or maybe take it away because he has no loyalty to that person. Isn't that, this isn't this why Paul, and when he's teaching to the Gentiles being grafted into the kingdom, he tells them about the gifts of God? Because God has given them gifts according to the loyalty, but he never gave them the priesthood. Nowhere in the New Testament, God's saying, Oh, hey, guys, the temple's going to be destroyed. Now I'm going to give you guys the priesthood of Aaron as a gift to you. No, he never did that. Paul never said that. He did the opposite. In Acts chapter 18 and Acts chapter 20, he went up to Jerusalem to keep the feast of Pentecost. And then James told him to take a sacrifice to the temple in which he had to go see the priests. Yeshua, when he healed the lepers, what did he tell them? Go present yourself to Jerusalem. And to the priest, according to the Torah. Because Yeshua understood the law. Let's continue. So, it says, It shall be for him and for his descendants after him a pact forever. Unquote. And in all the, grant, in all the grants, so here the grant is given for showing one's zeal and devotion for his master. And like the other grants, so also the gift of priesthood is given in perpetuity. In other biblical texts, which do not follow the rigid distinction of the priestly code between the priests and Levites, but rather adopt the Deuteronomic attitude of priests and Levites as one group, the grants appear applies to the whole tribe of Levi. Thus we read in Malachi chapter 2 verse 4, that my covenant may be with Levi. My covenant was with him in life and well-being. In a continuation, uh, an indication is also found about the loyalty and devotion of Levi, which is similar in its phraseology to the descriptions of loyalty of the Abrahamic and David, uh, and David Grand Covenant. He walked with me. That's the language that you see in the Abrahamic and the Davidic uh, Grand Covenant. He walked with me. So when he says the same language in regards to the Levites, that's a language, a legal language of covenant. Many of that you can find in this book right here. Many of that language you can find in this book, Declaration and Covenant. Declaration and Covenant. Very good book, by the way. 
another p another language that I use is is and he served me with integrity and equity. The eternal covenant with Levi is also mentioned alongside the covenant with David in Jeremiah uh, 33, verse 17. Priestly revenues in the ancient Near East were also subject of grants to grants in royal bestowals. So even in the ancient world, in Egypt, Mesopotamia, the Hittites. Guys, this is the foundation to get into the verses. In order for us to understand the verses, we need to know the legality of this from the time when the Bible was written, was given. The fact that all of this evidence have been uncovered in uh, Kinea forms and clay tablets is incredible in the late 1800s and early 1900s. And now we have the evidence to compare the biblical narrative with the legality of the ancient world. And now we can really establish that God is a God of laws. He established a kingdom with laws Grand covenants that no one, as long as he lives, no one can challenge. If you challenge his authority, we will lose. I'm a witness against anyone who challenges his people, his land, his priesthood, his temple. Because I understand now the legality of it. I must be loyal to God. I will be loyal to the Lord, regardless of what happened. I have to stand by his grant. I have to stand by his covenant. I have to stand by His Word. And I cannot give my own interpretation. I have to search. I have to look. I have to validate and be informed as to why and how He said what He said. So we don't fall in the same trap. Our forefathers did. Let's continue. Priestly revenues in the ancient Near East were also subject to grants and royal bestowals. This is indeed also reflected in Israel. The holy donations assigned to the Aaronic priesthood are formulated in a manner of royal grants. Quote, all the sacred donations of the Israelites, I grant them to you and your sons as a prerequisite. That is found in Numbers. We're going to read that in a little bit. A due for all, for all time. We can see that in Numbers chapter 18. Let's go to Number, the book of Numbers chapter 18. When I learned this, guys, I got to tell you, when I learned this and I understood it, I quickly repented because I understood the mercy of the Lord in my ignorance. And when I learned this, I cried out to him, I said, Lord, please forgive me. I did not know what I was doing, and I, re and I refused to go back that route. I refused to teach things that I know is not true. What, to be popular with people? Because that's the thing to do? I'd rather be loyal to God than be one in an island, but be loyal to God. And we need the kingdom to do the same. It's time to stand up for Him. Not for your buddies and your friends who may get mad at you if they don't like you or they disagree with you. If we, we will never lose, ever, if we are loyal to my King. I'm telling you, you'll never lose. He will stand up for us, and He will defend us, and He will vindicate us, because that is His character. My King is good and righteous. He is just. He is faithful, and He is loyal, and we have to stand by Him, no matter what. We have to. Numbers 18, verse 8. Listen to the language. I'll get there. Just give me a second. We're going to go over these verses again, but I want to share with you right now. Numbers verse 8 says, The Lord spoke to Aaron, Behold, I myself have given to you the responsibility of my contributions for all the holy objects of the, of the Israelites. I have given them as a portion to you and to your sons as an eternal decree. This will be for you from my sanctuary and the holy things from the fire. All of the offerings from every grain offering from every sin offering and from every guilt offering, and they will bring to me is a most holy thing for you and for your sons. You will eat of it in the most holy place. Every male will eat it, and it will be a holy object to you. This is also for you, the contribution, the contribution of their gift of a wave offering to the, from the, uh, of the children of Israel. I have given them to you. That's the legal language used in Scripture. I'm sorry, I'm supposed to be reading with me, and I didn't transfer there. I have given them to you and your sons and your daughters with you as an eternal decree. Whoever is clean in your house may eat it. 
So now we know the language that is using here in the legal language of the ancient world is it is also used in your Bibles. But how many of you did not know that that word I have given to you is in its legal context from the time when the Bible was written and the surrounding nations? Let me continue reading. I'm almost done, guys. And then we go right into all the verses. If we go to Leviticus chapter 7, Leviticus chapter 7, verse 34. Chapter 7, verse 34. It reads like this. I'm going to read from verse 33 forward, okay? The one among Aaron's son who offer the blood of the fellowship of, uh, offering and the fat is to have, if to have, the right th uh, thigh for a portion. For the breast of the wave offering and for the thigh co contribution I have taken from Ben Israel, from the sons of Israel, out of the sacrifices of their fellowship offerings. I have given them to Aaron. There it goes again, the language given them to Aaron, the priests, and to his sons and their portions forever from the sons of Israel. This is the anointed portion of Aaron and the anointed portion of his sons out of the offerings of, uh, of Adonai made by fire on the day when he presented them to serve the Lord in the office of the priesthood. Verse 35. Of Leviticus chapter 7. Look it up. Don't believe me. Verse 36. Adonai commanded these to be given to them from the sons of Israel. On the day that he anointed them. It is their portion forever. Throughout their generations. This is the Torah of the law of the burnt offering. If you keep reading. It's all there. The language is synonymous and is legal. Amen. Uh, I'm almost done. Let me read it. Grants of the tithe of a city to a royal servant are actually known for us to us from the Ugaritic. Ugaritic is modern day Syria, Lebanon, you know, or um, uh, northern Iraq. As we read, um, for instance, in the grant of Amistamru the second, Amistamru granted everything whatsoever that belonged to the city. To, Pe, uh, to Peen, forever for his grandsons, his grain and his wine of its tithe. The connection of the Aaronic and the, Le the Levites to Hebron has been recently pointed out. And we may suppose, therefore, that the, the, uh, the connection of the grant of Aaron and the Levites is rooted in Hebron like the other discussed grant traditions. I'm going to leave it there and I'm going to go right into the verses. But what I have shown today is that in the ancient Near East exists the legality of a language that points and directs us to understand really the rights of the priests on the earth. So right now we don't find anything like that in regards to the Melchizedek priest, priesthood in regards to you and I. Find me one verse where it says anywhere in the New Testament that now you and I are priests in the order of Melchizedek based on the gift that God has given you. Paul told us about the gift. God has given you gifts, but he never mentioned the priesthood. He couldn't, because he's talking to Gentiles. And the Gentiles cannot be priests. Yeshua cannot be a priest on the earth. So what makes us think that the Gentiles can? Even if you graft yourself into Israel, you become an Israelite. You still cannot be a priest. Because you have three different types of people doing three different types of roles in Israel. You got the Israelite, you have the Levites, you have the priesthood. The only reason why the priesthood has a little bit of importance is because of the temple service. But they're still all Israelites. All the priests are Israelites, but not all the Israelites are priests. Are you ready for the verses? I've been establishing the last, how long now? 54 minutes on the history. Let's read verses. Remember? This is important. Let's go to the book of Exodus 29. Exodus 29. And I, and I pray that some of you will take this type of study serious and will consider doing the research. Let's read verse 9. Verse 9, it says this. You are to gird Aaron and his sons with sashes 
tie headwear on them, and they shall hold the priesthood by a perpetual statute. In this way, you are to consecrate Aaron and his sons. And then he tells them how to consecrate them. To put blood on the, uh, on the, on the ear and oil. Blood on the thumb and oil. Uh, uh, anointing oil. B uh, blood and anointing oil on the big toe. To hear, to walk, and to do with your hands. So now we know he consecrated the priests. He didn't do that to the Israelites. He didn't do that to the other Levites. He only did it to the sons of Aaron. That's it. Okay? Surely, now a Gentile cannot come in and partake of this. Let's read chapter 40, verse 15 of the book of Exodus. Chapter 40, verse 15 of the book of Exodus. And the verses are going to appear random because I'm trying to read you as many verses as I can to establish the legality of the office of the sons of Aaron forever. Regardless there is a temple or not, they are still a family chosen by God to do the work of the teaching of the Torah and to do their work. Now, when the temple is restored, they'll go back to their office. And I'm going to show you that. Verse 15 of chapter 40. It says this, you are to anoint, I'm going to read verse 12, verse 9, <laughs> take the anointing oil and, the, and anoint the tabernacle and everything within it and consecrate it, along with all its furnishings and it shall be holy. Also, you are to anoint the altar of burnt offerings with all of its utensils and consecrate the altar. The altar will be most holy. Then you, sh then you are to anoint the basin along with its base and sanctify it. Verse 12, bring Aaron and his sons to the entrance of the tabernacle of meeting and wash them with water. Put on holy garments on Aaron, anoint him and consecrate him so that he may minister to me as priest. Also bring his sons, put tunics on them. You are to anoint them as you did their father so that they too may minister to me as Kohanim, priests. Their anointing with me will be for an everlasting priesthood throughout their generations. Moses did so just as Adonai commanded him. So let me ask you a question. Did God die? Oh, we always pray, blessed are you, O Lord, I got king of the universe. He knows, we know he lives forever. This is a decree by the most high Elohim. His son Yeshua cannot transgress that. His son Yeshua cannot go against this. This is the reason why Yeshua never went into the temple in the holy place and the holy holies ever. And even after he resurrected, nowhere in the New Testament narrative he tells us that Yeshua went into the holy place or the holy holies or told anyone to do so. Where is the evidence? You will think that 40 days after Yeshua died and resurrected, that will be ample time for him to tell the disciples, yo guys, you know, now this temple is obsolete. Now the priesthood is thrown away. Now we are the priests now. We can do their job. We can go in there and do it. And that never happened. So why are we doing something specifically in contrary to the actions that Yeshua never did? Yeshua never did those things. So why should we do them? Yeshua never usurped the authority of the priesthood. Why should we? Yeshua spoke against the corruption of the priesthood. But Yeshua never went in to try to do their work in the temple. Although he's the son of God, he respected the ruling of the, of the creator in regards to the anointing that he did. Now, the only reason why Yeshua could be king is because he was born out of um, uh, 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 Joseph, adopted him. And Joseph is from the tribe of Judah. And by adoption, now he has the rights of the inheritance. And because the gift of the kingship comes to the tribe of Judah as a gift to the line of David, by default, Yeshua now becomes, as the firstborn of Joseph, he becomes now a, a candidate for the king of Israel. It's all legal. So let's continue reading. Let's go to Exodus 28, verse 1 through 5. Exodus 28. We're going to read a lot of verses. The Bible speaks. We say we respect the word, but sometimes when the word says it, we don't believe it and we create our own theology. Okay? Bring your brothers Aaron near with his sons from among the children of Israel so that they may minister to me as priests. 
Aaron and his sons, Nadav and Abihu, Eliezer and Itamar, you are to make holy garments for your brother Aaron, for splendor and beauty. You are to speak to all who are skilled, whom I have filled with the spirit of our artistry, and make Aaron's garments for consecrating him, so that he may minister to me as a priest. These are the garments. So clearly, they were chosen for this job. I tell you something, and the more I read this and the more I review this information, the more fear I get. Now remember, there's something as a salt covenant. Salt covenant. God made a salt covenant with Pinchas. He also made a salt covenant with David. When you make a salt covenant in the ancient world, no one can break it. We have all of this evidence everywhere. Okay? Let's go to Numbers 18, verse 19. Actually, let's read from verse, 11, uh, verse 1 all the way to 19. And I want you to read it with me because I have it right here. Numbers 18, verse 1 through 19. Let's let the evidence stand for itself. Let's read what the Word says. The Lord said to Aaron, You, your sons, and your family with you, will bear the, uh, the guilt of, your sanct of the sanctuary. You and your sons with you will bear the guilt of your priesthood. They bear the responsibility. If they mess up in a ruling, in a judicial case, in the feast, in anything, they're the ones responsible. They take the guilt, according to Torah, because they're the one given the authority to, ter uh, to, to determine the times and seasons. So if you change your calendar, if you change the calendar without the proper authority, you just encroach on the holy things of God because in Ezekiel chapter 44, verse 23 and 24, the sons of Sadok, who are the priests, sons of Aaron, they're the ones that God told them to be in charge of the holy things, the Sabbath, the feast, which includes the sacrifices and the seasons, the calendar. This is the reason why I no longer follow whatever calendar I think people are following. I do the one that has been determined, declared by the last Sanhedrin Council. Because according to the Torah, they bear the guilt. They're the ones, if they messed up, they're the ones legally that they bear the responsibility. According to Torah. Not Judaism. According to the Torah. Okay, the rabbis did not change anything. They didn't change anything. And, and I, that's one, one adjustment I needed to make too. Verse 2. Moreover, Bring your brothers with you, the tribe of Levi, the tribe of your father, that they may be joined with you and minister to you, you and your sons with you before the tent of meeting. I want you to pay attention to the next few verses. This is very important. They will keep your responsibility and the responsibility of all the tent, only that they may not come near the vessels of the sanctuary and the altar. Now, this is important. The Levites cannot touch the altar. The Levites cannot touch the sacrifices. The Levites cannot manipulate the blood. The Levites cannot do any of the work that the priest could do, according to the Torah. If you're not a son of Aaron, you cannot do it. This, uh, they will keep your responsibility and the responsibility of all the tent. Only they may not come near the vessels of the sanctuary and the altar. So both you and they will die. Ladies and gentlemen, think about the ramifications of what we're doing. The Torah, which is law, tells us that if the Levite, who is supposed to help the priest do their work, if they touch a holy vessel of the altar, or the, or the things that were done in the Azara, the priestly courtyard, or they manipulated the blood, they will die, and the priest that let them do it. What do you think is going to happen to us? People thinking they could do their own uh, Passover lamb, slaughtering and then manipulating the blood on the doorpost. That goes against the Torah. Nowhere in the New Testament do we have the freedom to do whatever we want. Show me one verse. There's not one verse that we can usurp the authority that God established. Either the Lord is consistent through our scripture or there's something wrong. And so far I've seen the consistency all throughout. Did Yeshua go into the temple and brought his own sacrifice to the Holy Holies? I'm going to read this uh, up to verse 19. And then I'm going to give you biblical evidence when someone came in who is not a son of Aaron, going into the holy place, what happens to them? Okay, watch. Verse 4. 
they will be joined to you and they will keep the responsibility of tent of meeting for the entire service of the tent. A stranger may not come near to near you. You will keep the responsibility of the sanctuary and the responsibility of the altar. This is the sons of Aaron. There will be no longer be wrath on the Israelites because they're now no longer can take care of that. Look, I myself have chosen your no. Look, this is the Lord speaking. Look, I myself have chosen your brother the Levites from the midst of the children of Israel. They are a gift to you. Now the Lord has given the priests, not only the priesthood as a grant, now he's giving the Levites as a grant for them. As a gift to you from the Lord to perform the work of the tent of meeting. But you with your sons will keep your priesthood to perform your priestly duties for everything at the altar and for the area behind the curtain. I give you, again, no ten, the priesthood as a gift there it is guys a gift okay matana matana it's a gift very interesting interesting text i hope you all remember it they give the priesthood as a gift now you understand according to ancient legal documents from the time of the bible that no one can take the house or the property of the priest, or the office of the priest. It belongs to them as long as the king is alive. But a stranger who approaches will be put to death. Verse 8. The Lord spoke to, Mo, to Aaron, Behold, I myself have given you the responsibility of my contributions for all the holy objects of the Israelites. I have given them as a portion to you and your sons as an eternal decree. This will be for you and for from the sanctuary of the holy things from the fire of all the offerings, from every grain offering, from every sin offering, from every guilt offering which they will bring to me is most holy thing. For you and your sons, you will eat of the most holy things. And you already read this earlier. Now let's go to verse 18 and 19 to keep moving on here. But the flesh will be for you like the breast section and the wave offering. It will be for you like the right of the upper thigh. All the contributions of holiness that the Israelites offer to the Lord, I have given to you and your sons and your daughters with you as an eternal decree. It is an eternal covenant of salt before the Lord to you and to your offsprings with you. Heavy duty stuff, guys. Heavy duty stuff. We're all in trouble. If you keep preaching that we are now in the order of Melchizedek, we got a problem. Because we're not. Yeshua couldn't be in the order of Melchizedek on the earth. After the priesthood was established. On Mount Sinai, right? The Lord chose the sons of Aaron. From that moment on, they're the only ones on the earth. Because God gave it as a gift to them. Now, you can, you can quote me Genesis all you want. But when the moment that that gift was given to the sons of Aaron on Mount Sinai, the Melchizedek in Genesis 14 no longer valid. You can tell me that you can be first, uh, uh, the kings of Israel, the, the first fruit, I'm sorry, that the firstborn was supposed to be uh, priest, and you were right. But on the day that God chose the sons of Aaron, now they are the priests forever. Let's prove that. Let's go to Numbers. Chapter 10. Numbers chapter 10. Oh, chapter 8, I think it is. Okay. I'm looking for the verse, straight verse, so I don't have to read the whole thing. Okay, give me one second. Chapter 8, let me start reading and I'll find it here in a minute. Dedication of the Levites. Adonai spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and say to him, When you erect the lambs and the seven lambs to illuminate the area in front of the menorah, Aaron did so. He erected the lamb facing forward. Let's move on here. Let me read a little bit more. Let's go to verse, uh, verse 10. Verse 10 reads like this. Bring the Levites before the Lord. The, the sons of Israel will lay their hands on the Levites 
And Aaron will present the Levites before the Lord as a wave offering before uh, from the sons of Israel. Then they may go about the work of the service of the Lord. The Levites are to lay their hands on the heads of the bulls, use one of the sins offering, that means uh, purification, and the other as a burnt offering, burn offering to the Lord to make atonement for the Levites. Have the Levites stand before Aaron and uh, his sons and present them as a wave offering to the Lord. In this way, you are to set apart the Levites from the sons of Israel shall to be mine. It's a language of adoption. God adopted them now. And watch this. And you have purified them and presented them with a wave offering. The Levites will come to do their work at the time of meeting. But they are the ones, for they are the ones from among the children of Israel given to me in place of all the first the firstborn from the womb of Bene Israel. I have taken them for myself. So verse 16 tells you that now because of the sin of the golden calf on Mount Sinai, God says the, the firstborn of Israel are no longer going to be my priests. Because that was the original intent. But then they chose the priests and chose the Levites. And that's why you pay the, uh, the, uh, the redemption of the firstborn. The redemption of the firstborn is given to the Levites. Because now that's the ordained thing that God says. Now he chose them. Let me take you to First King Uzziah and Second Chronicles twenty six. Second Chronicles, chapter twenty six. We're going to read that chapter, not the whole chapter, but Second Chronicles chapter twenty six. If you give me like a few more minutes, maybe like 10, 15 more minutes, please. I really want to establish this point. This is very important. I don't want to record this again. So, in my life, I think that. This is probably one of the most important topics I've ever taught because it can save us from a lot of headache. Let me give you another piece of evidence what happens when someone goes into the temple into the areas that are reserved only for the priests, like the altar, the holy place, the holy holies, the holy utensils, the sacrifice, the vessels, the sacrifices. And I remind you that the king of Babylon, when the Persian king took over Babylon because he died that one night. Remember when the, when the finger came out and Daniel had to, you know, give the interpretation of what was written on the wall? What did that king of Babylon do? He, he requested the golden vessels from the temple of Israel. And he drank wine from them. That was only reserved for the service of God. That was an affront to the authority of God and His temple and His authority and sovereignty. And He died that night because He dared to drink from the vessels of the temple that was for the service of the, the Lord of Most High. In Second Chronicles, chapter 26, verse 16 to 21, it says this. Verse 16. When King Uzziah, this is the King Uzziah, when he became strong, his heart grew so haughty that he acted corruptly. Now, I want you to listen to the words. He calls the king of Israel from the tribe of Judah haughty because he wanted to do the work of the priesthood. And he called that corruptly. For he, trust, for he trespassed against the Lord his God by entering into the temple. Now, this is the king of Israel. Who was ordained to be king. But he sinned against God. By going into the temple. To burn incense upon the altar of incense. Then Azariah the priest. With 80 valiant priests of Adonai. Followed him in. They opposed Uzziah the king. And said to him. It is not for you Uzziah. To burn incense to the Lord. But for the priests. Who this, uh, the descendants of Aaron, who have been consecrated to burn incense. Get out of the sanctuary, for you have acted unfaithfully. You will have no honor from the Lord Elohim. I want you to meditate on those words. And this is the reason why Yeshua will never go into the holy place or ever think about speaking against the office of the priesthood in the temple. Because the Lord gave it as a gift it would have dishonored his father. Therefore, he would never do that. And this is the reason why in the Torah, a king cannot be a priest at the same time. 
You can do the priestly role and the kingship will separate for another family. Now, it's interesting that the Hasmonean family, after the Maccabean conquest, the Hasmonean family, there was a lot of corruption within that particular uh, family, the, the priestly family. And because of what the events of the Maccabean conquest, the people wanted the, the priest, Judah Maccabee, and his sons to have leadership, to become a governor. Now, he didn't want to do it, but he wrote a letter, and, the, and everyone accepted for a time being until the king was, was, uh, uh, was elected. Later on, that never happened. They never elected the king. The sons of the Hasmonean family, a priestly family, they usurped the authority of their own priesthood, and then they became king and priest, using the verse in Genesis and the book of Psalms, you know, you, you'll be a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek, using that as a premise for them to become king and priest. And it caused complete chaos in Israel. And we saw the outcome of that with the corruption of Caiaphas and his family. That's the reason why the King Herod came into pl in power, because of the corruption of the Hasmonean family. They became kings and priests at the same time in Israel and on the earth, and according to the Torah, that is forbidden. And this is one piece of evidence that proves this. Okay? So therefore now, let me continue reading. Then Uzziah, who had a censer in his hand, ready to burn incense, became angry while he was raging at the priests, leprosy broke out in his forehead right in front of the priests in the house of the Lord besides, beside the altar of incense. When Azariah, the chief priest, and all the other Kohanim stared at him, behold, his forehead became leprous, so they rushed him out there. Indeed, he himself hurried to get out uh, because Adonai has smitten him. King Uzziah had leprosy until the day of his death. He lived in a separate house with, uh, with Sarat, for, the, for he was cut off from the house of the Lord. He was cut off, a king of Israel, because he transgressed. He committed, he had haughtiness, and he, he acted corruptly before the Lord, bringing dishonor to God by going into the holy place, doing incense. There's another piece of evidence in the story of King Saul. When he did not wait for Samuel, by not waiting for Samuel, he did a sacrifice. And because of that, he lost the kingdom. Ladies and gentlemen, this is real. Yeshua never said the priestly uh, order of the, pre, uh, of the Kohanim, of the, uh, the sons of Aaron, were done away with at any time ever. He spoke against the corruption. Because they're supposed to be doing righteousness and justice. But he never touched sacred space. He never touched what God ordained as holy. That's how I know Yeshua is the Messiah. Because he did everything exactly as supposed to be. So right now Yeshua is a high priest in the heavenly tabernacle. Oh, he was. Because according to Hebrews, it tells us that he did that once and for all. And now he's sitting at the right hand of the Father in the majesty in heaven. Chapter 8 says that. And chapter 10 also says the same thing. Let's go to Hebrews. Chapter 10. Verse 11 and 12. It says, Indeed, every priest... Stand day by day serving and offering the sacrifices again and again, which can never be taken away sin. But on the other hand, when this one offered for all time a simple sacrifice for sin, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from then on until his enemies are made a full stool for his feet. Ladies and gentlemen, according to the Torah, he's no longer the pre he's no longer doing the priestly duties. He did that at once and for all because. That was a day of atonement. His, his work is eternal. Now he's sitting at the right, hand of the right hand of the Father, waiting to become the king on the earth. So, so far, and I have a whole bunch of other verses, we don't have enough time, but I want you to consider reading Numbers 16, verse 1 through 40. And I'm going to finish my last point supporting the authority of the sons of Aaron and the priesthood in Numbers chapter 17. So let's go to Numbers chapter 17. Verse 1 through 12. Numbers chapter 17, 1 through 12. The people of Israel are challenging Aaron and his sons and Moses. So the Lord basically settles this. 
by choosing a staff, the staff of authority. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the Israelites, and take from among, the, uh, the, among them twelve, twelve staffs, a staff for each family, from among all their leaders according to their families' households. Write the name of each man, each man in, on his staff, the name of Aaron and the staff of Levi. Because of one staff is for the head of each family of their families. You must then put them in the tent of meeting before the testimony. In other words, God is going to choose who is doing the priestly duties. Remember, this is the story of Korah. Korah is a son of the Levites, but he is not a son of Aaron. Korah wanted to encroach and he wanted to do the job of Aaron and his sons and he died because of it. Then the people questioned the authority of Aaron and his sons. So the Lord says, we're going to settle this once and for all. That's why he's going into the holy place and the holy holies. Because now God is going to make that decision, not men. Let's continue. You must then put them in the tent of meeting before the testimony where I meet with you. And it will, be, and it will happen. The men whom I will choose. Who's going to choose him? God. His staff will blossom. So I, will, so I will rid from among myself the grumbling of the Israelites who are grumbling against you. So if you are speaking against the sons of Aaron, the temple, the priesthood, the altar, the sacrifices, you are challenging God and you are committing encroachment. Straight up. And worse, if we say we are now priests in the order of Melchizedek, now we are completely challenging the Lord and we are now doing an area and an office that does not belong to us. Because God clearly has given it to them as a gift with a covenant of salt that he sanctified them, he waved them, he anointed them, and then he accepted the offering of that blood on that altar as ratification of that covenant that is eternal as long as the king lives. Let's continue. Verse 6, Moses spoke, spoke to the Israelites and all of their leaders gave him a staff for each leader, one for each of their families, twelve staffs. And the staff of Aaron was in the midst of their tribes. Moses put the staff before the Lord in the tent of meeting. The next day, Moses went into the tent of the testimony, and behold, the staff of Aaron from the house of Levi blossomed and put forth a flower that produced uh, blossoms, and it produced almonds. Then Moses brought out to all the Israelites, all the staffs before the presence of the Lord. And they saw each man his own staff. His staff. The Lord said to Moses, Bring back the staff of Aaron before the testimony as a guard and sign for the children of rebellion. There you go, guys. The Bible says it. If you are saying that the sons of Aaron are no longer valid priesthood, we, according to Torah, God says, you, you will be a son of rebellion. And let them finish their grumbling before me and not die. So Moses did just as the Lord commanded him, as he did. And the Israelites said to Moses, saying, Look, we will die. We will be destroyed. All of us will perish. Anyone who approaches the tabernacle of the Lord will die. We, uh, will we all die? And that's why again, then God says, the priests will take responsibility for anything dealing with the holy things, and they're the ones who will bear the guilt. So the Lord did, did us a great favor, if you're an Israelite. He loved you so much that he knew our nature to want to challenge every authority he has. That he goes, when it comes to the holy things of the priesthood, they are responsible. You are not to encroach on their authority, and they are not to oppress you because of their authority. But if they do something wrong, they bear the guilt. You keep them accountable. They bear the guilt because I chose them to be accountable and responsible to protect my holy things. So I pray that this teaching, short teaching, have been edifying to you and give you more evidence. We have a lot more verses. You can read Numbers 3, 33. You can read 1 Chronicles 27, verse 17. 1 Chronicles 12, verse 27. 1 Chronicles 23, verse 13. 1 Chronicles 24, verse 19. You can read also... Um, I got one more verse here. Leviticus 8, Numbers 3, Numbers 18, Numbers 8. 
There's plenty of evidence to establish this. And if you want to know the priestly 24 courses, you go to 1 Chronicles chapter 24. And tells you, and there it shows you whom God chose to be the priest and in the order. Ladies and gentlemen, I tell you, we need to learn the temple. 200 of, 279 laws of the 613 are directly linked to the temple. We need to go back to the temple. Study this. Learn their, uh, their legality of it. And I already read you from legal texts of the ancient world validating this point. The Bible is written in a very beautiful, concrete language. That when you learn that language, we understand jurisdiction, law, statutes, edicts, and instructions. And the Lord has been very clear. Example after example. What would happen if we encroach on the holy? Let us not become like our forefathers encroaching on the holy things. We have been called into this gospel, the good news, to bear fruit, not to sabotage God's kingdom or to encroach on the holy things and the holy things that our king has given us to protect. May the Lord bless you and keep you. Thank you so much. Go to my website, wisdomandtoa.com, and uh, let's study the temple together. Amen. Shalom to you. Bye-bye.